travels three to two, and like a BJ travels three to two, these travel four to five. So you do need a special set of controls. If you're going to make a pro make a prototype of this plane, you're going to need a very special set of control horns. And obviously, uh, I can supply them uh, to Big Jim's specifications. This plane also is made and designed in two separate sizes. One size specifically for the Super Tiger 40, uh, 40, Super Tiger 60, and the other size for the VMAX 46. These are two separate size planes, and I'll be building the smaller one. And obviously on this video, if, uh, if he manages to get down this week or next week, you're going to see some more of the construction of Dave Midgley's uh, new ship. And I, uh, I'm not quite sure how much he's got done, but next time he comes down to shop, we're going to try to get some of his stuff on the video, too, since he basically builds. We build as a team. We build from Jim Greenaway's numbers and uh, our own aesthetics, and we're basically building the same plane. Okay, this is tape 31. This is the beginning of tape 31. We're basically at the end of uh, the filler coat operation, and we're going to try to get the filler coat sanded out in the silver today if possible. It's absolutely pouring rain outside, so obviously we're in the, the winter of the building season here just before Thanksgiving. So what we're going to try to do, finish sanding this out today, try to shoot the silver on all our little parts, and maybe even get the fuselage in the first coat of silver. And I want to thank, on the end of the last video and the beginning of this video, people that are contributing photographs to this. And we hope to have a, an ongoing series of photographs at the end of each video. I hope this shop series of tapes is getting to be so popular, we should be getting a lot of feedback from a lot of people that are watching this. And maybe even like Walt Russell is, is contributing little tips and tricks of their own. And as we see their planes being built, maybe we can pick up some good building ideas from them. So. Uh, I'm trying to encourage everybody to send in some little tips, tricks, ideas, and we'll try to get them all on a video. Use this for kind of like a little forum. Obviously, you're not getting a lot of this in magazines lately. Uh, the magazines seem to be geared more toward the expert flyer. And uh, let's hope this is going to be uh, fill the gap that's been left by the magazines of not having the kind of information that you need to build and finish these planes. Anyway, we'll finish finish the sanding this guy out try to get a coat of silver on him today that's the goal for the day today now this is always one of the uh, the critical decisions you have to make now is how much of this filler has to stay on and before you put the first coat of silver on so what I'm going to do is run a little test on the rudder I have it all sanded out now I don't know how how accurate you can see how much filler is still left on here but what I want to do now, I'm going to mix up the silver again, the decanted silver. I went all through that whole thing on the, one of the earlier videos. And shoot on a coat of silver and get a feel for just how dry it is or silvery it is. Now, if it's perfectly silver aluminum, I know I have too much paint on here then. I have to go back, sand out the silver, and get some of this paint off. If it looks perfect, if the first coat of silver is a little dry at this point, I know I'm just about right, and then I'll sand put on the silver, sand it off, put on it three or four times, and I'll be perfect. I'll have that ultra lightweight, very, very thin finish that I want without a lot of buildup. So this actually becomes a test right now. This will be a test for how much paint am I going to need on the plane. Now, just in case you haven't seen the first couple of the videos in this set, this is an ongoing set of tapes. We have decanted silver in here, and right up to the minute that I'm actually going to spray it, I'm going to shake it up. As I spray it out, the first few blasts are going to be basically clear because it hasn't sucked up the pigment yet. Now, when you have decanted paint, again, you're going to have that initial blast. This is going to be mostly clear now. Now, I see the gun has been, oh, there we go. The gun is kind of clogged up. Now, if I had it spraying too dry right now, I would just go clean this tip. We've gone through all of that on previous videos. You know, and to help people out, to be really helpful, you have to see some of the mistakes that I'm making along the way. You, you, you know, obviously, if, if you uh, were to believe some people, nobody ever makes a mistake. Well, I make plenty of mistakes. Believe me, I've made plenty of mistakes, and basically the biggest mistake you can make is putting too much paint on a plane. There's no bigger mistake than that. 
That's the number one mistake. That's like coughing up the football on a one yard line. Now again, the first coat of silver is always your indication of how you're doing with this finish. Too much paint, not enough, just about right. And this will be my little test piece because I have the same amount of paint on everything here. And believe me, I hate spraying in a house like this, but I don't have a choice. Right now, it is pouring out there. Surprised we don't have water on the floor yet. Anyway, the first coat of silver I'll put on relatively. Just blow it right on. We know it's going to get sanded off. Get plenty of material on there. And now I know when I wet sand this off with 600 tomorrow or the next day, I'll know what to expect. Now, let's get a little close-up on this. We possibly can here. There you can see. What my indication here is, is that I have a little bit too much filler on because this doesn't look dry. This looks shiny, nice, shiny silver. Now that's the whole reason for doing a test. What, what this is telling me now is I have one coat too many of filler on here because I don't have a dry spot anywhere on this. In fact, I can see the reflection. I can almost see myself in this. What this is telling me now, and this is an important, important thing, is I have too much base coat, too much substrate on this paint. Right now, when this dries tomorrow, I am going to go sand off virtually all the silver and get down and sand some of that filler out or else this plane is going to wind up being another ounce or two too heavy. I have too much substrate on here and this is this is the way you test. Geez, if you don't get anything else out of these videos and you look at Walt Russell's plane, how he did the substrate and Midgley's and all of these planes, take a look at the substrate here. When this is this shiny in silver and you don't have any dry spots at all, you know there's too much paint on here. So what are we going to do? Let this dry overnight or preferably two or three days get the 600 and the sickens out and sand this puppy down until you spray on the silver and there's just a hint of dryness. Then when you have that, you know you have the absolute minimum, minimum amount of paint on there. Then you can sand that lightly and get on a nice coat of silver and you'll be absolutely sure that your finish is not going to go over the weights that we hope we're going to be able to maintain. I mean, we're looking for seven. We'll accept eight. When you get to nine or ten, you're adding basically two ounces of unnecessary weight. Now sure, you're saving a little bit of labor by not sanding it, but you're carrying, every time you do a square eight, you're taking two extra ounces along for the ride. Like taking an extra Super Tiger 60 uh, head along for the ride. No reason to do it. Anybody can figure this out, how to decide when you have exactly the right amount of paint on here. And that's my main goal with this tape and the one before it. If you can figure out how much is enough, you've gotten the benefit of watching these tapes. Okay, now using that information, now you have critical information at your disposal about how your finish is going. Critical information. You can take out your next one of the little parts, which in this case is the cowling. Obviously, and I'm not going to sand this down on the camera and waste another 10 minutes. I'll spend 10, 15 minutes sanding this down. But the indication is now, because I did all these parts from the same amount of paint, the same time, the same everything, I know I have a little bit too much filler, so I'll sand this down even further with the 320, take off even more material, and put the silver on this to try to get a feel for how much of this filler I want to leave on and take off before I actually do the body. Then when I go to do the body, obviously I'm going to do the bottom first and try to develop a feel for just how much to sand off, how much to leave on, and the last thing is I'll turn the plane over and do the top. And by that time I hope I'm going to have that absolute... And remember what one of the criteria is here. One of the criteria is we already have a plane where the wing is an ounce or two heavier than we want, so we don't want to add another two ounces and finish. What we want to do is have the minimum finish. Now it's like a football game and we're a field goal behind. We're not going to give up another field goal, that's for sure. We want to get the finish down, and the, the critical part right here is not to get too much filler on the plane. We want just enough that we have that just dry, matted-looking silver, and then we know we're going to have a perfect finish. And we know the finish is not going to add more than 7 ounces to the total weight of the plane. We've already figured in 7 ounces for that finish. So if I go ahead now and put 9 or 10 on, what I'm basically going to do is now instead of having a 60 or 62 ounce plane, I'm going to have a 65 ounce plane. And it's going to start being tail heavy. And then I'm going to need nose weight. And I'm going to, all those dominoes are going to start falling down. And the plane is basically not going to be 
as good a performer and have as wide an envelope as it would if it was the right correct weight. So this may be overburdening to somebody that's building profiles or, or somewhere, but somewhere down the road you're going to need this information because even if you're building profiles, you're not going to be building profiles forever. You're going to obviously work, and especially if you use these videos the way I hope you're getting benefit from them, you'll be, each plane will be getting better and better and better. So if you don't get anything else out of the video, get that feel for and look around and see how many other ways you can do it. The just a right amount of substrate that when you put on that first coat of silver, it's just a little bit dry. And you know you are headed toward having a seven ounce finish then. So I'm obviously I'll sand this down off camera and I'll get on with doing this today. And maybe even get the silver on today. Although I'll probably choke to death in his cellar. I don't have any ventilation. I know, you hope I choke to death. I know, I can hear it now. I can hear Midgley now. <laughs> choke sucker. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. The kind of friends you have when you fly stunt. Now, I got the cowling final sanded out. And what I want to show on a video, this may be helpful, I don't know. I want to kind of get this on a macro lens and see how much filler we've still left on here. Now I've tried to sand a little more than what I did on the rudder. Sand out a little more so that obviously now I'm not going... Now this should look dry when I put the silver on. I can see a couple of bad spots in it still too, so they'll come right up with the silver. Okay, so obviously what I want to do, get out the silver again, give it the shaking of a lifetime. Can't emphasize enough how much of that silver sinks down to the bottom if you don't keep shaking it. Okay, let's get our little cowl propped up here in whatever way we can. about perfect. I've got a bunch of little dry spots on here. I can see some of the seams coming through. So for the first coat of silver I would say this is a lot closer to being what I really wanted than the rudder is. And this obviously is all going to get sanded off so you don't have to go crazy. I'm trying to make it too pretty. Just get silver on everything that you can. Radius all the edges. Keep after those edges, paint the edges and radius the edges each time you sand it out. Okay, maybe we can get this on, on close up now. Now this is just a little bit better for the first coat. You can see some dry spots on there. Just a little bit drier than the rudder. And when it's dry, right in the back there, in between the two bolt hold downs, you can see some dry spots. This is going to be a lot better. This has a minimum amount of finish. Now, when I 600 sand this silver and put the second coat on, this might only need two or three coats. I still have a little bit too much filler on here. I'm still going to be more aggressive about doing the body, getting some more on there. Getting some more off, I mean. What probably happened is I probably didn't even need that third coat of filler. I probably could have gotten away with only using two on this, for whatever the reason is. But anyway, it's no problem. We'll just sand it. Anything you do with paint, you can always sand off and do over. Now, knowing what we know now about how this coat of paint is drying up, we're going to take the bottom of the body, start working up a few little spots, see how this is going to work out. Now one of the choices we have, because we're doing this filling on an ongoing basis, if this turns out to be too soft, if all of a sudden we see the sandpaper boiling up, we can stop this and we can get out the 600 wet and start working on some of the touch-up spots. 
so we actually don't lose any time. See, the idea of this is the time, the time allocation thing. You don't want to get to a point on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock that you can't do anything else because the paint is wet. You always want to have something drying, something sanding, something drying, something sanding. Time management is a big thing toward building a lot of, getting a lot of planes built. And when you're building as many planes as I do and working on as many, you have to allocate the time very carefully so you never get to a point where, up, oh, I have nothing to do. Everything's wet, nothing can be worked on. Work on one. If this is if this is okay, obviously we'll get a coat of silver on the body. Then if we still have time at the end of the day, I'll work on some of my touch up spots. I can always I can always have something drying, something ready to sand, something drying, ready to sand. And and doing that on a um, a time management basis. Do it like you would run a business. And I think you'll find out that uh, you can get an awful lot of stuff done. Mo most people don't use the time efficiently and they wind up wasting an awful lot of time when they could be building one or two extra planes a year. I gotta show you something that's real helpful is I've taken one of my blocks and put a little bit of an angle on it. Now what I do is I use that for getting in by the fillet here. That's one of the things that uh, has made getting these fillets a lot easier. And I can run right around the leading edge. Now normally where the judges pick the plane up, they're gonna feel a little imperfection right in here if they if they check. So walk it right around the leading edge. And with that little bit of an angle, you won't be putting gouges in the side of the fuselage. And you can also get a real nice, real nice finish on the fillets. I'd say if there's one area on the plane where you should spend more than a normal amount of time, if you're shooting for the concourse, or you want to try to uh, make front row instead of second row, Spend your time on the fillets, that's an important part. And we, we, these are obviously solid CA, we hope they're not going to crack. They're not going to do the epoxylite thing of paint all bubbling up and everything. But time will tell, that's for sure. Now we've got, <clears throat> got almost all the body sanded out here. And we're going to try to get the ship in a couple of positions that will allow us to get a coat of silver on the body and all the touch-up areas. We have to do kind of a little jury rigging job here because, it's, like I said before, it's really raining outside. Not going to paint outside today. So I'm spending any little time I have, any little extra time working on the fillet area and blending it in to the area that's surrounding it. I showed all those little fillet tools for doing the fillets. Now a couple little thoughts. We want to get a coat of silver on this. We know we had a little bit more than the normal amount of filler on here. So we took a lot of time and sanded a lot off. Went through in quite a few spots, but that's okay. As soon as we put the silver on, we'll pick those spots right up and we'll see them. There's a couple up by the nose. Uh, in these little, these little dolphin holes up in the front, I want to get these a little bit better too. But let me walk the camera around just so you can get a look at what this, what this tentatively looks like at this point in time. Still need some areas up here where we have to touch it up. Now we're going to jig it up obviously and uh, try to get a coat of silver on it today. Now on some of these areas where we went down, and obviously the trick is if you go through the tissue, you want to get the brush out, and it'll always be where the joint of the block the way the block joins, the uh, the hardwood joins the ball, so you always have a tendency to go through there. So I'm going to kind of go around the ship. Now just before I spray, and this only has to dry for five minutes before I'm just going to dust sand it out. Go through any spot that looks like, yeah, we've gone through. And there are a few. And it won't matter if you don't even sand it out, the silver, because you're going to sand the silver out anyway, so it's, not a, it's certainly not a big problem. And this will make it a lot easier because we'll have one extra coat of paint right on the uh, the bad spots. 
you just look around for any real dry spot, any spot where you've sanded through. It'll make it a lot easier the second time around. Now I also have my little piece of tubing with the sandpaper on it. I want to work these, these exhaust holes today. Try to get a little, obviously don't tissue inside of these. You just have filler coat in there. And each time you go through, radius the edge, number one. Best way I know of is just find a little dowel or piece of copper tubing and put a little 320 around it and work those, work the surfaces in there nice. Now right about now we've been sanding his body for about three hours. And needless to say, my, <clears throat> my hand and arm and everything is getting a little tired since I've been doing this every day. So I'm going to try to get the silver on there, kind of put this aside to dry and then start working on a tweener for a little while. See what I can do about the last couple of hours here. Working on a tweener a little bit. Again, the best way I know of is just to do it by hand, by feel. Run your finger along the fillets. Your finger will pick up the bad spots a lot quicker than uh, your eye will. Use your hand to find any little bad spot you think you can get out right now before we actually shoot the silver on. Use that fillet tool with the angle in it. This is a good time, by the way, to go right now and clip your fingernails so you don't wind up putting fingernail marks, ring marks, jewelry. You don't want to sand like a pimp with a bunch of jewelry and all kind of junk on and what you really want to do is be as free of that kind of stuff as you possibly can. Work the fillets in, the gap right by the canopy, we have the real sharp block for that. Again, I'll try to work that in. Constantly working toward the, the creep, the crevice, the crack. Work both sides of it right into that crevice. Again, you do most of it by feel, not by looking at it. You almost could do this in the dark. Because your eye can be fooled very easily. Now, Billy Warwich and myself judged the pylon appearance judging at the 89 Nats, and we had to look at 142 planes in about four hours. And you can't do it with your eye. You have to do it with your hand. You have to kind of run your hand over it, find a mistake with your finger. You feel we still have a few little dry spots up here. Edges, corners, get all the edges, all the corners at this point in time. Radius everything. How many times have I said that? Edge up, top. And I'm guessing right now we're almost ready to spray you. Got a funny kind of a line in there. But your best bet is by hand. Feel all the little bad spots with your hand. Get used to feeling them. A dry spot will pop right up. It'll feel like sandpaper when you do this. And blend it right into the silver. Obviously, that's a very easy thing to do right now with plenty of silver on there. It should blend right in. Sanding is done, and I'm just trying to get some of the extra talc off. If you wanted to right now, you probably could prep all this down or run it with 600 seconds, but since we're going to sand it all down again anyway, the only time I really bother to do that is when I know I'm not going to sand the next coat of paint. 
get all the dust and things off that you think you can get off. And then you have to figure a way that you're going to hold this. Now, obviously, if you have one of those finishing friend deals, that would be handy to have right now. We don't have one, and we usually block it up in such a way that we can paint part of it at a time. Paint part, then move it over, and you can paint the other part. But figuring a way of fixturing this up, either you use it between rolls of paper towels or on a sponge here, the stifle sponge, or whatever. And again, shake the silver right up to the point you're going to use it, and as you're using it, and the only downside of this is we're going to be doing this in the, in the shop here. And we're going to have to use the fan to try to get some air in here before we die of asphyxiation. So I got most of this wiped down. Obviously, I want to get all the dust that I can off the table. And this will just, I'm just going to try to show one way you can prop this up. The, uh, the low budget way. Obviously, most of the stuff we do around here is the low budget way or the no budget way. Anyway, this is an old technique I used to use. Clean these off. Get a couple of rolls of paper towels. Again, you notice we're painting the bottom first. Always the bottom first. Trying some spots where it's not. Okay, we're not going to touch any of the repairs that way. Really, we just have it up on some paper towels here and the tip of the rudder. So as long as you keep it off the table, it'll be just fine. Okay, we got the compressor up, 25 pounds. do some touch-ups here. This is a couple of the bad spots that we've gone over. Earlier on when Warren was here we tried to do a little a little show and tell about setting up a new spray gun, some of the things that may help you get it set up. Again because this coat is going to get sanded out it's not ultra critical. The trick here is not get tempted to run the pressure up beyond 25 pounds or you'll wind up putting too much paint on a ship. Because it's raining outside, I expect we're going to have to put a little retarder in the paint, but so far it looks good. Looks like we won't even need the retarder, which would be a nice little saving of time. Now any place you sanded this with 320, you've got to run some more paint over it to seal up the sanding scratches. And you'll see all the little dry spots will come up. What they're going to look like is little bubbles. They're going to look like little bubbles in the paint. Where the silk span is coming through here and a couple of the dry spots. Now, it's obvious we've done a real good job of getting off all the extra paint here because this is coming out. It looks like we've sanded too much off now. We might have gone in the other direction a little too much. But that's okay because we can just put a second coat on. It's not a big deal. This is a good time to start working some paint in down by the tank box. All the places where you know the thing wants to be fuel proof. Any place you see that looks dry, you can go back before it dries and just lay on a second coat. Obviously you don't want to get any runs away from here. get that much done, 
What I want to do is show the dry spots. Got a little fan fired up here. Now I want to see if you can see on a. I don't know if we can. You can catch like it looks like the little, little tiny dry spots along the edge of the wing, like a catwalk. Some dry spots along the side of the body. Now obviously we'll do everything we can do from the bottom, let it dry a half an hour and flip it over and do the top. That's one good way to do it. But while we're at it we can get some of these little repairs, these spots we've been repairing all along. Now when you get in by the nose here, obviously you want to get in kind of fuel food things up. Inside the pipe tunnel, one spot you want to get. And what we'll probably do is when the plane is all finished, we'll get in a pipe tunnel with, we'll mix up some black Imron with a brush and paint the whole inside of the pipe tunnel with black Imron to fuel proof it. And that'll give a nice glossy finish. So this will just be a lick and a promise coat inside there. We don't have to worry about getting it too fancy. The uh, what I did on other planes is when I'm all finished, I'll mix up some black Imron and brush it on. By the way, if you do brush on the black Imron, do it outside where there's plenty of air blowing. Don't do it in a confined area. If you do it outside with the wind blowing a little bit, you won't have to worry about it. Again, as we're doing this, we're looking around for any dry spots. Any spot that looks dry, this is a great time to get at it. Just double or triple paint it with the silver at the same time. We've got some bad spots out on the wing here we want to touch up. Because really, from this point on, we're only going to use 600 sandpaper. From this point on, the only sandpaper that'll go on a plane, we hope, unless we find some really rough spots, is 600. And that won't leave any sanding scratches, we hope. That would be obviously our first choice. And when you spray to fill it, you'll usually see any little spots you miss, any little spots that aren't just perfect. You're going to see right away the problem. The silver really doesn't allow you to have any mistakes. It's the whole idea of doing it. Again, just a reminder, don't don't even try using automotive silver or anything but six silver. It just adds too much weight. The only product that I've found that works well here is six silver. Absolutely no substitutes for the six silver. I see a nice big dry spot along the body here, so I'm trying to hit it two or three times. Now you get to a point where you can't you can't reach any more in this position. Once you get to this, now I see the dry spot here, I'm just going to lay this on double or triple, right on that big dry spot. Dry spot over there. Keep looking around and just hit it two or three times. Because now we're going to put this away to dry for a day or so, or two days, or how long. Now, while you still have paint in the gun, you want to reposition the plane. Grab it by a spot that you don't have any paint on, and you can kind of reverse it now. You don't need any fancy tools to do this. All you need is two, two uh, things of paper towels. And I guess that's one of the things I really want to uh, emphasize is you don't need a lot of equipment to build beautiful models. You need a really minimum amount of you need a minimum amount of equipment and a maximum amount of patience. And again.
again, we're just looking to pick up dry spots here. Any spot I see, I know the back of that trailing edge is ratty. Give that an extra coat so I can sand that down later. And we'll get to the point now where the all the paint on the bottom will be drying and we'll put the plane away for a while. I'll go work on some thoughts or whatever. Get away from here for a while, let the cellar air out. We had a bad spot back by the road there, I remember. Again, we're trying to get on the lightest, thinnest, flattest coat of paint we can right now. In fact, we're running out of paint right now. As soon as you see that dry spot, go back over it. Go back over it two or three times, not a problem. Okay, I gotta put more paint in the gun now. Okay, we got the paint mixed up. Keep working on those dry spots. And you're going to see other little spots. I know like the hinge lines back here are kind of ratty. Any spot that looks kind of ratty, go back over it with paint two or three times. That'll just give you that much of an edge. It comes time to block sand this out with 600. And again, the biggest temptation, don't, don't jack the pressure up and don't get the mixture up so that the paint's going on like it's coming out of a quart can. It's always a big temptation to just jack that pressure up and put too much paint on. We're trying to do this and keep the weight down, hopefully. Now I see lots of spots back here because I sanded an awful lot off back here. Lots of spots where the tissue, the little threads of tissue are coming through and that's good because it means we don't have any extra paint back here and the second or third coat of silver will be all this needs. spot up there. I just can hit that with another little whack on the paint. Got a dry spot back here. Okay, now it's time. That's got to dry. Kind of take a look around here and see what we got. Now my feeling is this is just about right. We don't have too much or too little. Obviously now what we're going to do is let this dry a good half hour or so, then, pry, then flip it over, and then paint the other side. So we'll do that off camera. We've got kind of a, you've, you've seen the spray technique. When it's the other way around, it'll be on a tail wheel and the two rolls of bounty, and it'll be a piece of cake to paint it. We need to go out and get a Some fresh air would just be, uh, in order here while the cell is kind of gassing off.
these are real dry spots up here on a turtle deck. Now all this means is when we sand this first coat down, we're going to put a little extra time into sanding it down. Trying to get every dry spot I can see. Usually you'll get the dry spots right around the edges or in the fillets. edges back so there's a put some paint there. Okay now the trick is put this aside to dry. Don't touch it for a day or two. Okay we got all the silver on today that we're going to get on. This is about the end of this day anyway. Put them up in a rack to dry for a couple of days. When we come back, we'll uh, sand them out with 600. That'll be the end. Actually, it came out better than I thought it would. Kind of happy with the way it came out. But obviously, still needs to be. I've uh, never seen a plane that you could get the silver on in one coat and be happy with it. It's going to take a couple coats, that's for sure. We got the cowling, the rudder drying over here now. So, that'll be it for today, and uh, let this dry up. Again, the longer you let this dry, the easier it's going to be to sand. If you let it dry a couple of days, it'll be a piece of cake. Now, the whole last weekend, uh, my partner here, my brother-in-law Roy, took the camera to go do train show videos. Obviously, anybody knows we sell train show videos, too. Uh, and what we wound up doing, I wound up having some free time this weekend, so I, I knocked out the body to the tweener pretty much uh, not too different from the one you just saw built, so I don't think anybody missed anything here. Nothing new, nothing too exciting here. Uh, we laid this one up, and uh, a couple of the new criteria, what we're doing on this one, I'm making the canopy end right at the hinge line, where the hinge line is rather than if you look at some of the other prototypes it goes about two inches further forward so this will leave a little bit longer nose and I think uh, Dave pretty much has the same thing on his and basically we're building the same plane. Now this plane is the tweener this is the Jim's design it's a uh, a plane that has half of the characteristics of the LJ and half of the PM and basically the flaps are very large, they're going to be very large flaps and they're going to move at a ratio of 4 to 5. The flaps are almost 4 inches at the root, almost 2 inches at the tip and they move at a ratio, the ratio that they move is a 4 to 5. The elevators move 5 to the flaps moving 4. Now obviously this is a prototype plane, we're not spending our whole life making it fancy, we just want to make it good enough that if we decide we're going to fly this plane at, uh, say, at Lubbock, that we can do that. Now, if anybody remembers the uh, the LJ series of planes, Killer B, Concourse Winner, uh, Louisiana Lightning, Relentless, it was a nice series of planes, and I think the only downside of the whole plane was we had some people judging in that time frame that didn't like the look of high aspect planes. Now, uh, now the, the, the hopefully the uh, the judging core has come to accept higher aspect ratio planes. Obviously, they've accepted walkers, which is pretty much uh, uh, in the direction of the higher aspect, bigger flap airplanes. If you go measure it up, he's not far from uh, what Jim's numbers were and are, and the airfoils are very close. So uh, and so we feel like we can take this plane now, make up a prototype, and uh, see how competitive it's going to be. And Midgley's making up the foam wings for me, and we should have them here next week. Uh, this is Thanksgiving weekend, and uh, you know it's <laughs> Karen's going for her operation Tuesday, so there's probably going to be a giant gap in these films.
uh, when my wife gets done with her operation, I hope we can we can kind of pick this up at some point in time. I'm only going to have maybe an hour, hour and a half every night to work on it. It doesn't pay to even videotape it for that amount of time. But uh, basically the same fuselage construction pretty much as the first one. Not a whole lot different. Big pipe tunnel going through the body. This is made up for VMAX, but it will take a 60 or a 51 if necessary. I guess the only thing you can see on this is we have a little bit of an angle to the fuselage. If you look at it right down the front, we've angled the top up a little bit. I don't know if that's going to matter. We have some little slots here so we can slide the motor and the header in as one unit. That's one of the criteria we want to have is be able to slide the motor and header in in one shot. And any time you organize up the pipe tunnel, obviously you make, make perfectly sure you have plenty of air going through there. Notice we have a, an air vent out on top. We're going to have big giant dolphin holes like Midgley had on his fuselage. And uh, like I said, there's not too much different on this fuselage than on a normal one, except we're moving a canopy back just a little bit. We're even using the same spinner that we're using on the, uh, the normal 51 size Cardinal. But this will be the tweener. And uh, when we do get to get back to this, uh, let's hope it's, you know, everything's going to go okay with this operation and we'll get to uh, get back to our videotaping every day. Now today I just carved up in glass this cowling. The glass is drying. Same technology we used on ship one. the prototype pipe set up here that's uh, we're going to be using obviously just to fit into the planes just to make sure we have plenty of clearance for the pipe system and this is a 60 pipe and a 40 and that's one of the combinations we like a whole lot we're going to try to use that first coat of silver is just cooking away there and it, uh, it should be relatively easy to sand. It's been drying for a week or so. Get that sanded out. We have our rack made. Actually we got quite a bit done in this uh, very hectic time frame that we're working in right now. I've been trying to squeeze in an hour or two of work every night but uh, obviously I do have to get some sleep in between all these doctor visits and everything. Look at the size of this box. Oh, this is the box that the tweener foam wings are in, the foam cores. And Midgley cut these wings up, he shipped them down, he said they were in a big box. I can't believe what size of this box. Alright, now what a good thing to do here is, I have the uh, for the twin. I'm only going to have an hour or so to work on this today and I'm hoping I'm going to be able to sand most of this silver some or most of this silver off and get another coat of silver on. This is the number one plane of course and maybe get the tweener wings out of the box and take a look at them and weigh them and see if a mouse ate the foam or whatever. Now obviously you know that Karen's going in the hospital so we won't be having a lot of time here but I want to show this one thing we do have is an outstanding day for painting. The paint will be drying. I want to get real quick. Got a nice call from Herb Chung today saying how much he enjoyed the uh, the videos on sanding silver. So I decided to put on a few more minutes of this. Now what the trick is here is this silver has dried up now for quite a while. Oh, I don't know, a week or so. While, while we fooled around making that tweener body. But now this silver is rock hard. It's sanding out like butter. Should be able to sand that fuselage out in a very, very short amount of time. And what I'll do, obviously, I'm using the uh, the cowling for a little test area here. Get an idea what this is going to look like. If we're going to need one or more coats, or if we're going to need a coat of clear on this. Keep the 600 seconds on there. Keep it good and wet. Now let's get a little look on the. Uh, on the macro lens here. 
what this is going to look like. I just want to, the reason I'm showing this is just to give you an idea of how easy this sands once, once you have it hardened up for a week or so, then sanding it out is a piece of cake. It's no effort at all. You talk in terms of minutes to sand it and get a nice, nice feel on it. Now that should be enough. I want to look at this on a macro lens now. Now another thing I'll just mention about how we're always talking about, uh, now let me get telephone. Okay, just had a neat call from a guy that uh, is going to convert a Cardinal over to an RC ship and how to put the servos in. I can't wait to get pictures of that. Anyway, now what I want to show, I'm going to show this on a macro lens a couple, of, a couple of different ways, is you saw how much time I spent sanding this. Okay, now what we should look for in the end of that first coat of silver, and let me, let me do this on a macro lens. All right, first off, you're looking at, this is a close-up of the cowl, about how much silver I've left on. And you can see there's a little bit of a shine to it. Now knowing just about how much, and like I said, if you haven't seen the rest of this series of tapes, these shop tapes, uh, there's one, almost the whole tape is on sanding and sanding silver and fiberglassing and things like that. You might want to check that out. But, but anyway, this I think is like the single most important step in building the whole plane and getting that finish, getting the front row finishes, getting the silver sanded out. And this is absolutely perfectly smooth now. If you were to uh, just rub your hand on it, you probably could buff this out. Now when I hold that up to a uh, you know, fluorescent light, you can see it actually, I'm candling it now. I'm trying to show you know how I would go about candling it. But you can see there's a few little dry spots, a few little spots right there with the middle of the light. You can see there's a little bit of a lump. And we're going to block sand some of this out. Get a look at just about how much finish is really on there now. This, this is such a critical thing and I don't see any way you could help somebody achieve the knowledge they need to do this other than just to show them and show them how much sanding has to be done and how much material has to be on there. When that part you're doing is in silver you want... Yeah, I just went outside and shot this. Such a nice day outside to shoot paint. And you can see, just get a rough idea of Let's put another light on. How, much, how much shine we have. Light doesn't even work. Anyway, how much shine we have on a material and Obviously, we'll put this aside to sit for another couple of days. Maybe work on the rudder and a fuselage now while we have a day to spray. And uh, keep in mind, the longer you let the silver sit, the nicer it's going to sand. You save yourself a lot of work. And that's what I'm trying to show in this, is how you can manage your time, work on one plane, put it aside, work on the other one. You know, like I said about that time management thing, now we're in the middle of building two planes. I assume most people are building more than one at a time. And while this is drying up, now while this silver is drying, I'm going to work on that tweener body a little more. I have the blocks to hollow, so that'll give that a couple of days while I'm working on a fuselage. The silver will be drying. That's just amazing when you let the silver sit, and this, this is really probably just sanding out like butter would be the best word to say. Just, just sanding out by itself. You're saying the whole piece, the whole plane would be sanded with one coat of paper here. Good thing I'm not standing where I, you can't see this. Anyway, let's get this over here now. I don't want to drip on the floor. This, this should save you in the course of building a plane 20, 30, 40 hours of time. Here's the rudder after a little bit of sanding that we did. Just to give you an idea how much silver you're supposed to be leaving on and how much you're supposed to be taking off to get that nice final finish. Obviously around the horn here we had to get in with a block. Even though that looks rough, that's pretty well sanded out. And anything, obviously, uh, anything that's a little imperfection is a little bit of an imperfection here. We'll just block sand that right out. All right, and after this, we're going to get on to uh, working on that top block for the tweener a little bit and open up that box of wings and stuff. Not much time left today. Like I said, it's uh, kind of going to be a short day here, but uh, we'll get done what we can.
a little bit of sanding done on this silver here and then kind of show close up what we have. scoops we went through in a few spots so we just put a little red light up there and let it sit. We want to find that filler tool we had. A real nice filler tool here up until a couple of days ago. We showed this, this we were using to cut the fillets. Now we'll use it to sand the silver off. It just has a little radius on one side. Same thing, just take the 600. Keep it good and wet. this coat of sanding, we look around in all the fillet areas, anywhere there's a little bubble, and just, just hit it with the point of a number 11 blade. And you're going to get bubbles no matter how careful you are. We also, right in here where there's a reverse fillet out, put a hundred little pinholes in there and slit it. Now, what I do now, take some super jet, the thin, put it on the end of a Q-tips and you got to work fast. Because the cotton in the Q-tips will kick it off and walk up and down that fillet real quick. Don't fool around. Get it on there and get it off. Get rid of that one. Another one. Now this is going to kick off in a matter of seconds. But what you're doing, you're actually pressing down the bubbles, letting a little CA to capillary motion get in there and pressing down. And obviously sometimes you have to go back over this four or five times. In this case we do. I see the bubbles still up a little bit. Just go over it four or five times. Doesn't matter at this point in time. We're going to put more silver on a plane and sand it off. That's the whole idea of the silver is to get it on, find the mistakes and get it off. Now this little spot up here, same thing. Soak up some CA and a Q-tips and just keep pressing it down. Now since you're going to put more silver on here, you don't really have to worry. You'll blend it right in with the next coat of silver and the wet and dry sandpaper. Keep replacing the Q-tips. It's the cotton in the Q-tips that'll kick it off. You don't have to put kicker on this. And that's how you can fix bubbling fillets early on in the program. Worth its weight in gold, that little tip. And no matter how careful you are, you're going to get these little bubbles from time to time. In this fillet area here, we had to do a little repair. And up on the nose section inside the scoops, needed to do a little bit of a repair where we had some nicks. Now, this is the area we just repaired, and this is a typical rudder, rudder fillet that's going to be a problem. In the back, you can see where the little bubbles used to be. Now they're filled with CA, the capillary action. Hopefully, 
If we miss it again, though, it's, no, it's not a big deal. Just go back and do it again, right up until the last coat of silver. And when everything's perfect, you paint the airplane. Keep sanding it off and taking it on. Don't wimp out. Get on with it. Okay, we have the first coat of silver sanded out here. You can see kind of the rough spots. You can see a lot of the spots. I stuck my fingernail in over there. Immediately went home and trimmed my fingernails. Uh, good idea to trim your fingernails before you put a gouge in it anyway. Uh, we're going to try to take advantage of the fact that it's uh, it's probably 40, 45 degrees that we can run outside and spray this right now. Get this sprayed today and uh, this will be sitting for all the time that old Karen's in the hospital for their operation. This can be sitting here so uh, we'll try to get this sprayed and that's going to be it for today. We got most of the silver sprayed outside. I just have to get the few spots that I can't get when I'm holding the airplane. Get the final little touch up on this and gonna put it aside to dry for a few days. Now, what I can do right now, too, I'll walk around this guy, take a look for some. I see a couple little bad spots up along here, a couple of spots up there, and I'll get after them with the red lead right now. Now, I want to go around here with the nitrous stain and a razor blade. Picking out the little spots that need a little touch-up, we nearly have them right there. There's water right here. And again, this is the whole idea of sand and a silver, to get it perfect. You can put this on a half hour after the paint dries and it's fine, it's not a problem. Pick out all the little bad spots, we got one over here. And usually the bad spots at this point in time are going to be where you wound up putting your fingernail while you were sanding. So again, my suggestion is get down to the manicurist and get a real short fingernail trimming. And if you keep after this like I'm doing, you just keep going. Keep picking out the spots, look for more bad spots. The more bad spots you can find at this point in time, the better off you're going to be because they won't show up in the final finish and you won't wind up sanding right through them. And I guess that's it for today. Okay, so what we're going to do, put this guy aside to dry now. Let him dry as long as possible. And come back and work on this when it's dry. There's just a couple of little spots we're going to be working on. Up on a nose here there's a spot too I red light it up. And inside the scoop you can see a fingernail mark. Usually it's the corner of the sandpaper or it's your fingernail mark that puts that little spot there. Now another thing. Another thing, hey, like I said, while, while the paint is a little bit soft like this, get all the little spots touched up that you want to touch up. Because then the red light can be drying at the same time as the paint, it'll make it sanding a lot, sanding of it a lot easier. Now I notice back here, I can see here, I don't know if you can see, it's a little soft spot. What you'll see, it, right, let's catch it with the light, right there, you can see it now. What happens is it's a little bubble, it's a little space, a little place where the uh, you have a negative radius, and it's pulling up the paper right there. I don't know if you can see that. Right there, there's a little spot. So now, while the paint is even wet, I'll go down, 
get that little number 11 blade, poke it full of holes and put some hot stuff in it. And the whole trick now is to be fussy, 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 and put in the time, pay the price, and get this airplane looking like it's made out of uh, one solid billet of aluminum. And I know that's really time consuming, I know that's really, uh, I don't know, hard on your hands. I guess you could see what my hands look like after a day of this. But, uh, you know, Frankenstein aside, Tin Man aside, whatever. Th this is the way to the front row, and I don't know any shortcuts. Well, the only thing I hope this is going to help you figure it out so it's a little less painful than it was for me to figure it out the first time. Okay, we got as much of the touch-up done as we could here. These parts are all sitting here in their uh, second coat of silver, and now, point number one here. We do have a little time left. We'll try to work on this top block. We got some of the hollowing done, but we certainly don't have it all. And we're putting this scoop similar to the one we put in Midgley's plane. So we're going to get busy hollowing this for a while now. Yep, bone again. Okay, one of today's jobs is going to be to make up the ray rudder, uh, the little horn that goes on the ray rudder. Get the hinge pockets cut, get the rudder installed onto the top block. Oh, by the way, we got the tweener wings out of the box. The biggest box on the planet is the tweener wings. They look real nice, and uh, obviously we'll try to get some of that footage. you got to remember, this time of year it's hard to do it because the camera's out on loan to the train clubs when they have their shows because we're doing these train videos. So we don't, we don't always get the whole picture here. There may be some gaps. But uh, after the first of the year, we should go back to having a full-time camera in-house right by the workbench and we're going to start doing that uh, the series of videos for the uh, the 1993 shop series. Here's something that's always good to have some Snapple iced tea. Anyway, we'll start working on this now. We don't have much time left today. Now we did a good uh, good little time management thing there. Dick Woolsey just called up from uh, Massachusetts. He's telling me about his new twin. He's building a twin. Maybe we can get some photos of that, put it on the video, I don't know. I'm encouraging him to take some pictures or some video as he builds it. I'm trying to get the... Uh, I went through my notes about five minutes ago to look at what my top blocks used to weigh. And I noticed the lightest one of the top blocks, which is on the green cardinal, was 19 grams. The heaviest one was about 24. So we're looking for between 19 and 24 for this when it's hollowed out. And obviously that would include the fin and the rudder. Then I'll know. Now I really haven't had good wood this year. This is not the best. Midgley had some good wood, but I didn't. And so uh, we're really going to have to work on hollowing this out and getting it thin in spots and stuff. And I'm just, I'm just using the gouge now trying to get the big chunks out. But like I said, I'm not going to do it on camera. Because this is not really a good piece of wood, I can see by the way it's cutting. I'm, and to meet my uh, weight of 26 to 19 grams when it's hollowed out and ready to install, I'm really going to have to get this sucker paper thin. So maybe what I'll do is I'll make up a little sanding block and get some 80 grit paper in this. Because just by feeling it, I can feel this is not going to be a paper thin one. Also, I have all the material around the scoop up here, and I had to reverse curve carve this. This has to be carved in reverse where the scoop is. So obviously, uh, at this point in time, now somewhere around this point in time, I'm going to get out the scale and start weighing this from time to time and see how we're doing. That'll be the next step. Now just in the rough hollowing stage, before we even get in this and try to finish it up, we're at 32 grams. And that's not really a good weight for this. I mean, right now I was hoping we'd be at uh, 24, 25 and then start pulling out the last little bit. But uh, anyway, at least if you know ahead of time what some of these things weigh. And that's why I tell everybody, try to keep track of what your stuff weighs. Keep track from year to year what your top blocks weigh, your wings weigh, crutches, whatever. This way you have a chance every year of 
knowing if you're in the ballpark or if you're going light or going heavy. Well, here's just some of the weights for some of the things we've been building this year. But all these notes get saved. I have a weight on everything. Everything gets saved. Put, in it, put it in a box. Put it in an envelope. Next year, take it out and see what some of this stuff weighed. Alright, we're going to get back and try to get some more material out of here. Obviously, we're not on the light side. Now, good trick. I've got this area hollowed out. This area hollowed out. I leave this for last. I'll do that with the Dremel tool. These are the spots where I've gotten it too thin. If you hold it up to a light, you can see them turning very, uh, where you can see the light right through them. I don't know what the right thing is. I've gotten this real light. This is a very difficult thing to carve right here, by the way. I've got this reverse imaged, and I still have to get the tail post done. Now one of the things that's easy to do, what I do, is I run a Dremel saw right up through the middle, up to the point where the rudder is going to end, and I can spread it apart and get in there. Otherwise it's very difficult to get in here and get this last little bit of wood out. And obviously in the back you want to get all the wood out possible. The back is the most critical part to get thin. If you leave a little extra meat up in the front it won't matter, but you sure don't want to have 8-10 grams of uh, extra wood back here. job. Obviously we can just spread this apart a little bit, get in there and hollow it out. Also another thing that's real helpful, I'm going to show this on the video, but doing these tail posts is this little, the gouge that exacto sells with the point on it. And obviously that's one of the things you can get in there with very easy. Well with that last little bit of hollowing, we got it down to 29 now. 29 and pushing. sneaking up on having our desired weight here but uh, the hard part is yet to come now we're gonna have to get the last little bit of weight out of here and as you get <clears throat> as you get toward the end each grain gets harder and harder to get out and of course you just gotta just keep holding it up to the light looking for the thin spots Get yourself a nice 100 watt bulb, 150 watt bulb, so you can hold this up against. I'll tell you one thing, it makes it a lot easier when you have nice soft wood. This wood is really hard to carve. I'm very unimpressed with this piece of wood. But it is so hard to get good wood. And just be aware, you can get away with building a plane without good wood. It's just two or three times the amount of work. It's just an unnecessary amount of work, which is what's happened to me here. Spend an awful lot of time hollowing a block. Usually it takes me an hour, hour and a half to hollow a block. This is going on three hours. And I don't even have the rudder on yet. Anyway, I'll do the rest of this off camera. We're just going to keep hammering away at this guy until we get him down to, say, 20 or so grams. I made up a sanding block with a little bit of a curve in it, put on some 80 grit paper, and I'm just using this to get in here for the final little bit of weight that's out. We got this down to 25 without the rudder, and we can get one or two more out, I don't know. Like I said before, this is a handy time to go look at your notes and see where you are. 
As far as uh, component weights go, this is a good time to check it out. Now because this is not really a great piece of wood, we may not get down to the dull weight. And we'll have to make it up by somewhere in the finish, leaving out one of the coats of clear or whatever. But we'll certainly uh, give this every shot. And the best way to do this now, feel it, hold it up to a light bulb, see how you're doing. And just keep going up on that scale. We got this down to 23 and a half, and it's just, there's just no more material left to sand out of here. I don't want to make it paper thin so we get ripples. But we're going to have to settle for 23 and a half on this, and we'll weigh the fin and rudder and then add it together. Okay, our fin and rudder are 5 grams. So this is <clears throat> 28 and a half all together. Total weight of the top block, rudder and fin, 28 and a half. And that's really on the heavy side, so we're going to have to uh, start thinking about cheating some paint here or cheating the fillets or something. Something's got to go if we want to keep this under 60 ounces. After another half hour of final sanding and patching up a few little holes and sanding out a little bit more, we finally got this guy down to uh, 21.8 for the top block. That means our assembly with the tail, with the fin and the, the rudder is going to be a little under 27, 26. Now that's heavy and it's good to know right now just uh, you know that we're not, this is not a super light piece of wood, or rather ratty piece of wood. Midgley didn't give me his good piece of wood like he said he would so uh, we'll see what I give him when he comes down here next time. Instead of pizza he's going to get linoleum. Anyway, we want to get a component weight now. We have the fuselage here, but what we want to do I want to take the fuse, let's get everything on the scale at the same time. Fuselage, the top block, the rudder, the fin, and the cowl. Now the cowl has one layer of glass on it. Let's get over here and get the cowling. Put one layer of glass on a cowling. Okay, now this should give us a component weight. And we're obviously looking for about 10 ounces. 10 would be a, an excellent number. 9 would be, uh, you know, certainly acceptable. It means that in the overall picture here, even though we have a heavy block, uh, we're on track. 10 ounces means we're on track. Let me dial this in and see just about what we have here. And if you don't have a grain scale, oh, there goes all the junk. Hard to do this while looking through the camera lens. Okay, now our balancing act continues. We have everything up on the scale. Cowling, rudder, fin, top block hollowed, and of course the whole fuse crutch. And we dialed it in, it's a uh, 196 which is seven ounces, which means we're three ounces on the light side here as a total package. So we're real happy about that obviously, and because we're using a foam wing, we'll probably pick up two ounces. So we're looking at a net gain of about an ounce here. So our 60 ounce plane is uh, right now, hopefully at this point in time, a 59 ounce plane. I've recorded up all the weights, everything up on my chart. 196 grams, 7 ounces. And the next step is going to be we're going to put the, the fin on the top block here. Now I want to show this on the macro lens. What I do is I take the fin and put an angle on both sides. Then I'll go into the fuselage top block and carve the reverse angle into the block. So that instead of just having a butt joint, I have what amounts to be double or almost triple the amount of glue area here. And what I do then, I'll, well, I'll try to show this on the tape. I try to tape everything in position so I have the rudder, the fin up at 90 degrees, not laid off to one side, not laid off to the other side. I have it nice 90 degrees and then I just tack it in with hot stuff. Now one of the things I have to do is get the top block in position. 
and I put a little mark on it so I know I've kept the trailing edge parallel. Just kind of eyeball that up parallel. And then what I do is I try to uh, make a mark here because I know this is not going to be attached when I put this rudder on. Okay, now I want to get in and carve the reverse of that angle into this top block. And all I have to do here is just take out a little bit of the material, make a little pie slice down it. Now, a couple of things. Last year's uh, yellow concourse plane, after I had put the rudder on real nice and neat, and let the block sit and put some dope on a block, it went off to an angle. So I'm going to really monitor this, this this time. I don't want to have this the rudder, the fin on, on any angle at all. I'd like to have it dead 90 degrees. That didn't seem to cause a big radical trim problem, being a little bit crooked, but for sure I want to get this one straight. So I'm going to put a little bit extra time into making sure I have this groove just right. I have everything lined up. Okay. Obvious now because you can spread the back, it lets you get in there with a sanding block. Get in on the other side. Once you think you have the angle lined up just right, okay, now we want to do a little bit of a test fit. Now I just folded black back the blanket, I could get some more of this off, and I'm trying to get this, I have my little alignment on, I just want to get one drop of glue holding this on for now. Make sure I have it at 90 degrees, which I'm just eyeballing for now. go any further, get the old crutch, make sure I haven't lost any of the alignments on it, okay, now with that little notch what it allows, we have it tack glued and what it allows you to do is make little or tiny adjustments if you need them. And in this case, we don't. doesn't look like we need any. So we can just work our way down, put a few more drops of glue here. And keep monitoring it, make sure it doesn't start walking over to one side or the other. Check that we have this edge parallel. And then we just, for the final thing, just run a bead of glue right down the whole assembly. Now, after the final fitting, and you make sure you have this pressed up against the nose ring, you have this angle right. Make sure it's at 90 degrees. It looks close anyway. Okay, then what we do is turn it over, get the CA out, and just, you can see the rudder coming through the bottom of the block here. Run a nice big bead of thin CA on there, and I guarantee you that rudder's not going to crack out. do is where the fin attaches to the top block right on that joint I put a little piece of 64th 32nd or 16th plywood this rudder is thin I'll use 16th and make a little radius make a little fillet there and then I sand that whole joint in 
and I can put some DAP on that and that can dry overnight. Okay, I just trace out that little piece of plywood. Now I'll go over and cut it off with the saw. Now I cut the first piece and then I realized I had the grain in the direction wrong, so I cut a second piece. Notice how the grain, the grain goes, if you put the grain this way, you're not going to have any strength. Two of the three layers that apply with the grain wants to go this way. So the easiest way now is just hot stuff this, obviously. We'll hot stuff this in position. It's hard to do this on a macro lens. And then we'll take a Dremel drum and put the radius in. It's a lot easier to do it that way and you get a nice smoother joint. Sanding drum on here. That's a nice easy way to get that that radius in there without a lot of problems. Available at Fortune Off, the source, the watch expert. Now one of the reasons I like to make this piece out of plywood is because guys hold your plane like this with their thumb with their thumb, and they always wind up destroying the front half of this rudder. So I hit that with hot stuff. Get a block and kind of blend this in a little bit. And then we'll put a little bit of DAP on there and we can put this aside to dry. And the only thing left to do yet today, I had on my list, and keep in mind I make a list every day. I wanted to put the little horn for the Ray Brother linkage on there. So I have to lay out at what point on the on the rudder it would be. I don't want to have an angle going up or down. And I'll do that next. It is real important to have this little piece made out of plywood. It saves a lot of wear and tear on the airplane, guys launching your plane. Now, whenever you put the DAP on the rudder, you don't want to have this built up in one big layer. So I'm trying to put it on in two or three thin layers. This is light DAP, ordinary spackling paste. And remember, now this is one of the places where you're going to have a reverse curve on a fillet. So obviously, one of the things you don't want to have here is an extra an extra radius. You want to keep this fillet as small as possible. And keep the dap good and thin. If you need to put a little bit of water in it, nice and thin is the trick. Before I put the dap down, I always wet the wood first, too, just to get a little, little better adhesion. It's an old masonry trick from... Always wet the work before you put the cement on. Okay, dampen that out. Now, we know we're going to need two or three layers here. We don't want to try to do this all in one layer. If you leave it on plenty thick, it won't matter. And tomorrow we'll sand this down. Now 
Uh, here's a trick that'll save your life. When you make the little horn for the ray rudder, obviously you can make it out of nylon, but then you have the bolts coming through the other side and it looks like something like an RC plane, which we're trying to avoid. In this case, what I want to do first off, the tail is going to sit on top of the fuselage so I know where I want to have the horn sit. I want it in a parallel line. If anything, down a little bit. Okay, this is the last thing today. We made this little plywood horn. And I wanted to mention, you cannot make these horns out of 16th plywood. You don't have enough grain direction going in them. What you need to do is laminate four pieces of 64th plywood together. And when you do it, have the grain go this way, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. Put four pieces of 64th plywood. Cut out your horn shape. And which in this case, we're giving ourselves plenty of uh, room to adjust this. Plenty of room to get a... Uh, you know, a final tune on how much rudder we want here, even though we're using standard rabe numbers. Okay, the other thing is this this horn that I put cut a notch right in the wood and grind and sand this flat, hot stuff it, make sure the horn is nice and straight, it's not all cocked off to one side or whatever. Anyway, it is important. I have made them out of 16th plywood and they have broken in service. You make it the way I just said with four pieces of 64th plywood CA they probably will not break. That'll save you a lot of uh, aggravation somewhere down the road. Leave it roughly a half, three quarters of an inch long. Put a lot of holes so you can adjust it. And obviously you want to have the horn just a little below. The rod is going to come out. One quarter of an inch will be the center line. So we'll drop down our probably an eighth of an inch over this fuse side and we want to have a straight, you don't want to have the rod travel down this way, that's nonsense, and you don't want to go up. If you go up at all, you'd like to have it dead neutral, but just in case, leave it a little bit down, just an eighth of an inch or so, otherwise you're going to wind up with no fillet in the back. You won't be able to make a half a fillet, like we did on the uh, first ship. Well, that about finishes up what we're going to do on this fuselage. I think tomorrow when we come into the shop, uh, We'll pull out the foam wing that middle of the year sent, see what kind of quality we have, and start getting ready to do the foam wing up. I just want to show this on the video, too. You know, in the previous uh, sets of video, we were using tape to do this. Now this is the, the self-sticking ace bandage that you can buy in a hardware store or a, I guess in a drug store. And we're using this to mold up leading and trailing edges now for future stabs. What we do is every day we soak a, a sheet in ammonia, make up a sheet every day, so that at the end of uh, say two weeks or so we'll have 8, 10, 15 sheets to choose from when we build our next set of tails. These, of course, are the leading and trailing edges for the flat tails. And when you're finished, if you haven't seen the tail video yet, you have a piece of molded uh, 16th wood that's exactly a half inch. Use a 3 8 rod, tape it to a 3 8 piece of balsa wood with masking tape. Soak the wood in ammonia. And you can see you have an almost, almost perfectly uh, molded leading edge or trailing edge as the case may be and obviously we're gonna when we do the tail we'll consider using this as one of the ways of doing it we also have a foam tail uh, we'll be looking at several different choices on the tail for this plane you can see you can see what we've done we have a nice selection now we've got three made already we're gonna make another one today but from these now we can pick the straightest truest ones What you do is just go down to the store. In this case, this is a couple little things that are different than how we did this in a previous time. And these ways seem to work a little bit better. We're using clear ammonia. And obviously, you just go down to the, the store and buy some. Take a paper towel. You can buy this any place you can buy food, really. Look for a piece of A-grain balsa. 
nice straight a grain wood that you can put a little bit of a bend in and the way I've been doing this is just soak up a paper towel you really get a you really get sick to your stomach doing this so wet the whole piece down the ammonia definitely works better than Windex and I remember in the past having talked to uh, Al Rabe about this Frank McMillan too who have molded a lot of pieces and of course Harold Price used to use ammonia on his when he did the uh, the Defiant I remember him making the leading and trailing edges with I can, I can just squeeze out the extra ammonia Phew. and uh, if you do this indoors like we are here without a fan it's a real problem you really get it gets smelly after a while but anyway you rub the ammonia in now eventually somewhere down the road I hope soon anyway we're going to be working on maybe making up a mold for the top block so that we can mold top blocks and obviously if we do one of the things we'll be able to do then is sell them you won't have to make the mold yourself plenty of ammonia Take a nice deep breath because this stuff really stinks. But this, I just thought this would be worth showing because this ab absolutely works better than the Windex. The Windex works. The first way we did this on the original, the original video of the tail, we used masking tape and Windex, and this way is so much better. Okay. And you can see you have a lot of flexibility now. try to line this up a little bit now some of the wood the wood that you do some of it will split and some won't depending on the grain of the wood that's why this this one does not look like a particularly good piece of wood so I'm gonna put some extra ammonia on it and this is why I make extra ones up before I start a tail I want to have four or five or six in case one splits and you can only make one a day with your mold so if you mold one a day and you make eight, ten sheets, you'll have them for life and you might even find some other uses you can use them on. Obviously one of the nice uses would be if you could make a tail with cloth hinges, you could make the leading and trailing edges both out of this, assuming it was a flat tail. It would be kind of a neat thing to try. Yeah, and you can feel, now you can feel this is starting to get really soft. Try to get it somehow in the middle here. And what I've done in the past is thumbtack it down, get some push pins, old map pins or whatever you want to call them, just to hold it in place. put the lid on this ammonia because this stuff really can get you down after a while and this now is a self sticking bandage so once you start the, the motion going now, now see this piece split so this is not going to be a good piece now maybe we could salvage this and I don't know if we can because I've never tried this because it's split right down the middle Again, you should only be using A grain wood, and I'll do this as a test. I wonder if we can make a, a half piece. Since we really only <coughs> we really only use half of the uh, the piece of wood. Yeah, well, it looks like we're going to get a half of a leading edge out of this. And this way, nothing will have gone to waste. Keep it in the middle. The bandage kind of self-sticks, so that's nice. And I think what we're going to try to do more and more in the future is use this, this technique for a lot of reasons. One of them is we can't get a, an unlimited supply of good wood anymore. Good wood is really getting hard to get. And this will allow us to use heavier and heavier wood that normally we couldn't use. I guess it's kind of good that this piece split because it shows you that you can salvage a piece that maybe you've, uh, you've written out of the program already or you didn't think you'd be able to use. 
Now it's split right up at the end here. Now it's funny, we did five pieces that didn't split. And this one here is definitely split halfway. So we'll have a half, maybe an elevator out of this piece. And this is definitely, even though you, this piece did not work out well, you can see that this now would be a much better uh, way of doing it. A much better way and kind of press it down. And now we'll be able to use, say, up to, it looks like the split ends about here. We'll be able to use about three quarters of this. So, anyway, when you see in future videos these molded pieces of wood, that's the way we've been making them. Okay, we're going to finish out this video with two things. We want to look at our top block again. This tap has been drying overnight, and we'll try to get a little sanding block with a radius in and get this fillet out. Now, a couple of things about this fillet. You want to keep the curve as shallow as possible, and you want to build the fillet up in two or three layers of tap. You don't want to try to do it all in one layer. Then you want to take CA, run it along the leading edge, the leading edge, and the edge, so that these edges get real rock hard. So every time you walk by, you don't ding it. These are razor sharp edges. And then we'll work on building up a second layer on the fillet. We also want to dig out our box of hinges. We want to get some half A hinges here. We see we have them. Uh, these are rudder hinges. We use the uh, half A, the small nylon hinges. Now a couple of things, because the rudder is eighth inch, we're going to use these smaller hinges and small hinge pockets. And one of the things I have had a problem with in the past is when you cut the slot out, and you press the hinge in, okay, and then you, you do all your tissue in and everything. Now we, when your plane is buffed out and you go to put the hinge in, it puffs the wood up. So what I'm going to do is leave the hinge in for all the time that the dope is drying and all the sanding operations and everything. I'll always have a piece of a hinge in there so that I don't get that wood to pucker up the way I did. I'm also going to lighten up the hinges the way I did on the, we need four hinges by the way for the rudder. Four hinges will be fine. And these are the ones, again, these are the ones we use the small nylon hinges. You don't want to use any any thicker of a hinge than you have to back here. Again, we have our little tool. It has sandpaper on one side, sandpaper on the other side. This is for cutting the big hinges. It's for cutting the small ones. You notice the, the width. Again, you just make this out of plywood if you've never seen this. And obviously, you want to lay out four hinges. Now what we really should do is replace this piece of sandpaper pretty soon. And that cuts, let's get that on a macro lens. That little tool cuts the hinge pocket real nice and neat. Again, if you haven't seen what that tool looks like, it's a piece of eighth inch plywood, light ply, with a piece of sixteenth plywood and a piece of sandpaper glued to it. In this case, the sandpaper is getting old. We ought to replace it. Just glue it down with contact cement. Makes up some real nice. We have one side for the big IM hinges, the wing hinges, and one side for the rudder hinge. You make up a little tool like that. It'll save you a lot of time. And all your hinges should go in relatively quickly. You know, obviously, we keep all the hinges in one box for whatever, uh, some of them are dyed, some of them are white. In this case, it won't matter, the white ones will be fine. And we're gonna work on that fillet a little bit there. And you can see how this tool, it just, it cuts the, it cuts the notch and it stops just short of making the pocket too big. It just makes exactly the right size. And as you, as you grind it in, you get exactly the right size hinge pocket. Now the other thing we do, because we don't want these hinges to pucker up as much, now we don't want, there's, there's obviously very little strain, is take a scissor and cut half of the amount off, since we're going to use uh, epoxy on the final assembly. Clip the corners off, 
This cuts the weight of the hinge down by about one third too if you go and measure it. It has the standard Dubro uh, half a hinge and where we're finished cutting them down you can see how much material we've taken off. They, they virtually never come out. If you use epoxy to put them in there's no way they're going to come out. And the wing hinges even if they did come out we have the hinge lines taped virtually all the time anyway. And this will save you um, an amount of weight that you'll be very surprised when you see if you use 15, 20 hinges in a plane and you cut the weight in half, it adds up. It's one of those things that just goes along for the ride. Now I make, <clears throat> I make my own hinge uh, inserting tool from a, a number 26 blade, just saw it off with a Dremel tool. Take a parting wheel and put some scratches on it. This is the same tool I use to uh, get the epoxy in the hinges and just file the front down to a point and that lets you cut the uh, the slots for the hinges real nice then you need to get in there with a a number 11 blade and pick out the extra wood but this will get it in there real nice and if you just hold your fingers on each side when you do an eighth inch wood it's really a problem That's about as neat of a, a hinge as you're going to get. Quick and easy. Not a problem. Try to get it centered right in the middle. Work it in real slow. If you feel it coming through one side of the wood or the other, you know you have a problem. Go back and forth in. That's why we keep the outer surface of the blade rough so it, it gives some texture there and you can just push the next one in. And you can go right down and get all your hinges done in, in a very short amount of time. Handy little tool and you can make it up for free with a used uh, blade. You don't even need a new blade, you can take a used one. I think somewhere on earlier on in the video we showed how to make that tool and go back and do that again. Anyway, this is about completing it. We're going to work on that rudder, uh, rudder fin fillet. And then we'll finish out the video with uh, some of the pictures that have come in over the last two weeks of new, new projects people are working on. This way we end up the videos uh, in a nice clean way. This will finish this video. We'll finish the fuselage. The next one we're going to do is we're going to start on uh, the foam wing. If you haven't seen a foam wing being built, the next tape is going to have the complete foam wing, putting the gear in the wing, sheeting it, glassing it, everything. Let's hope we get a, a good video. It'll be real helpful for you. We have a built-up wing now, and we do need a sheeted wing. Now, as I said before, now that you have the hinges in here, you'll notice you have puckered the wood. You've spread the wood out because you now have the thickness of the hinge in there. So what I do from this point on, I'll leave the hinges in, they're not glued in, and I'll just block sand down both edges so I don't have that puckering effect. Especially after we dope this a few times. And this way you have a nice tight fit on the hinges. You're sure to get a good grip when the epoxy goes in there. And you also won't have that, that look of everywhere there's a hinge that there's a, a puff. You just rub your finger on that and feel for high spots. This one here feels a little high still, in by the horn. The idea is at the end of the year we want to have, we already have building a D-tube wing on video. We have building a wing with the box method, a sheeted rib wing. And now we should have a whole foam wing tape so no matter how you decide you want to build a wing there'll be a video that you can use for uh, picking up the way we do it and hopefully uh, learning some of the tricks and tips that we use here and that have worked well for us. Now just don't forget that when you insert the hinges in here 
and these are not in permanent, you want to get the pucker out of here too. And obviously we'll do the back of the fuselage here all at the same time. And then we'll just pull this apart. This is, <clears throat> this is the block we use for getting that radius right in there. And just kind of clean up that dap, put the second coat on. Sanding this, we'll put a second coat on here and then put this away. This will about finish up the uh, this tape. And I guess starting tomorrow, we'll start working on that foam wing. All right, that completes the end of the seven ounce fuselage that uh, we hope we've shown uh, some of the construction techniques on. We don't want to repeat everything, obviously just the unique features. We're going to go on and uh, put some photos here like I said uh, before. And we will go on, the next step in this is going to be the foam wing. The video on the foam wing. So hope you're getting some good information out of this and hope you enjoy the photos at the end. Yeah, there's the original Cardinal uh, 51 in the, in happy days when it was still 54 ounces before the repair, before the ultimate crash. Anyway, we have that repair on video, obviously, for anybody that wants to see it. Just another thing you might be able to use sometime. Now, of course, my <coughs> my uh, lovely wife Karen here pinching my behind. I don't know. I think she had a good grip there with a pair of pliers or something. It really looks like I'm in pain. Jimmy and Debbie Borelli. Great days at flushing. This is from one of the early flushing contests. Here's a real neat photo from Rusty Brown in Colorado. Rusty's, uh, sending me several photos over the years. This is one of his nicest efforts. Picture of Ted Fancher uh, getting ready for the 84 Nats. This is the super light plane he made for the 84 Nats that never really panned out. can see in the background what a beautiful shop this guy's got. You know, definitely money talks in this hobby. Come on, Ted. Put some lead in that top block. Dave Midgley's wife, Sharon, one of the sweethearts at the event. This is the blue plane that's on all the development videos, the 51 development videos. This plane had a very illustrious life, for sure. One of the planes we'll remember forever. The blue guy. Now just look at the size of this fuselage. This is going to be a future semi-scale stunner. Check the size of his body out. I think this body weighed seven ounces too. He said he used a watermelon for the uh, the mold. I don't know. This is from the uh, 92 Nats. Now this is just to show you a meeting of the AA uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, Rehab Club. This fella right here is now building a 51 Cardinal using all 15 pound wood. 
More on this later in the video. This is Dave Cook's son, and he's building a 51 Cardinal right now, too. And uh, obviously, Dave gave him all his heaviest, rottiest wood, so uh, last I heard it was coming out about 80 ounces. Definitely one of my favorite guys in the world of stunt. One of, if not the favorite guy, John the Godfather de Tavio. And this is him cooking up a storm at uh, the flushing contest. He gave out uh, all kinds of cool Italian food for everybody. We all had diarrhea, and then he made us pay to get in the outhouse. Here's my nostalgia Fox 35 powered Nobla. This is the one that all the videos, the Nobla videos. This is the Nobla right here of the Nobla videos. And a big Jim Fox 35, molded Midgley canopy, top flight 10.6 that had a 25 cent price tag on it. What nostalgia. Plane will live in infamy. Dave Midgley in younger days. This was at one of the original Mass Cut Me. I think this is the year Midgley won. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. No, this is the year Suarez won the Mass Cup. Uh, Midgley won the year after. Anyway, two of his uh, original, the old planes, a Pattern Master and a Dave Cook plane. Both Super Tiger 60s. Dave, you're getting old. Russ Hunsberg is a original 60 Pattern Master with a tune pipe with a 51, Tiger 51. Now building a smaller size uh, Cardinal. And we'll probably have some of that on video when Russ comes down here to work on it and do the paint job. Believe it or not, this is Jimmy Casale in 1982. This is a 1982 photo when he was into bodybuilding and uh, whatever else he was into, I don't know. Anyway. This was his Air Force at the time, and I was over his house shooting some pictures. This is one of the pictures. These were all the planes that went to the uh, 84 Nats. Here's Helen Paul, Wynn Paul's wife. This was at the team trials. This was the ship Wynn flew that year at the team trials. This is Sandy Hunsberger, affectionately known as Busty Hushnagel. And this is one of Russ's planes. This is the one that uh, Russ picked up the handle on upside down and uh, became a million part kit. And we repaired it and uh, it's back to being in one piece. Still gets good service out of it. His original Persian. No, this is not a deodorant commercial. This is a hand signal. Oh my God, look at this. Lou Walgast, the man who moved to Arizona. Anyway, Robin Sizemore's nice plane here. Sorry, Robin, we're making fun of your arid deodorant here, but uh, anyway, speaking of that, I just heard from Mike Cavell yesterday in Saudi Arabia, and he's. Uh, Wrote me a nice letter saying how much he likes using a camel instead of a car. Can't wait to get back to the United States and see some real women. 1985 Concourse winner to Killer B. Come in fifth at the 85 Nats, won the Concourse. Had a very illustrious life as a test plane for tune pipes, Rossi 40s. Was the test plane in all of the Ritchie Tower. Uh, development program. Now speaking of, speaking of molded parts, this airplane here, this is Frank McMillan's MB5, Martin Baker. This had about a thousand molded parts on it. This was an unbelievable plane. You really had to look close and you had to uh, look at how many molded, he had molded scoops and molded decks and leading edges and all kinds of things molded on this. So a lot of the technology uh, that we're using obviously was used by others before us, uh, Harold Price and Frank and Rabe and everybody. But uh, we really just want to make that molding uh, technology available to everybody, just in case you haven't seen these old magazines. Bruce Ships, real nice magnum. Notice the fuse gear. Notice he took advantage of all the technology, heavy duty control systems. Nice paint job, nice.
There's Wood Van Duzer, who now works for Randy Smith, who didn't take advantage of anything he knew. Ward, the hat's got to go. Here's a picture from one of my customers in South Africa. This is Nina Atfield, Percy Atfield's wife. You can see by the AMA number, this is uh, the South African AMA. If 31 people down there flying stunt, then uh, recently bought about, uh, God knows, 10 Super Tiger 51s for me and a bunch of pipes and headers and stuff, so I guess they're really getting into it. Anyway, more on this later. I seem to get pictures from uh, Percy every month. Hope we get some more. There's a picture from South Africa of the guys flying stunt down there. Some of the guys flying stunt in South Africa. Kind of cool group they have. You wouldn't expect it, but uh, stunt is alive and well in South Africa. Now what photo collection would be complete without a picture of the old Sidewinder? This is the one that's on all the construction videos. Still have them. He's running with a Super Tiger 60 now with a tuned pipe. Converted over to fiberglass engine mount.